So I'm session chair. My name is uh, Rogier. Um, the honor to, to uh, announce uh, Moritz Muller about the DNSSEC uh, key rollover. And Mo Moritz is from uh, SDN uh, Labs. Okay. Thank you. Um, if there are any questions later on in Dutch, then uh, feel free to ask them in Dutch as well. That's fine. So um, this presentation is about the root case K rollover, which happened in October last year. And probably, as you might have remembered, um, that quite a lot of people were very, very worried about this root case K rollover and thought that maybe horrible things might happen and millions of users cannot access the internet anymore because this thing, this DNS thing, broke. As we heard, it's always DNS, and this might be the case here as well. Um, you probably also might have remembered that this wasn't the case, that the, the world kept on spinning, uh, the internet kept on working. But I will show you in our next slides that actually a few things went, at least were a bit strange at least, and I will show you also why this happened. This research has been carried out with, uh, with uh, people from six different organizations, among others two root server operators. So we had quite a unique uh, collection of, of people and vantage points for our measurement as well. And this is a, a research that we also published at the conference, uh, and you can check out the paper for more details as well. As well. So let's first bring everyone up to speed and uh, explain for us a bit so what DNSSEC is. So DNSSEC brings integrity to the DNS. So imagine that you have a setup like this one here with a recursive resolver, and this recursive resolver would like to know what are the name servers of .com. So it then asks this question to the root servers, and the root servers will respond with a list of name servers for .com. So this is great. But also you might notice that, let's remove this annoying thing here, um, you might notice that there is no way for the recursive resolver to check if the response it got from the root uh, is actually correct or not. Um, and this is where DNSSEC comes into place. So with DNSSEC, the root zone is signed with a public-private key, and, the, uh, and every single record in the root zone is then assigned as well, and for each every single record, we attach a signature to the response. And the recursive resolver can then receive the signature as well. But in order to validate the signature, it also has to have a copy of this public key of the root server, and it also needs to trust this key as well. And now I'm talking about the root, but of course you can sign basically every other zone in the DNS, and every other zone really depends on this um, uh, key here on the, on the top. So when we replace this key here on the top, we need to be sure that every single recursive resolver that does validation, that validates these signatures, has this new key in place and trusts this new key. So this is a very crucial step that needs to happen before you exchange the key here on the top. And this is something that we measured, um, among other things. So for the rest of the presentation, I will use case K2010 for the old key and case K2017 for the new key. Um, but before uh, we dive into the measurements themselves, First, a bit quiet some words. Why is DNSSEC and rolling specifically so hard? Um, so as I mentioned before already, imagine that you replace this key here on the top of the root, um, but you don't have a, but your resolver does not have this new key, then this means that your resolver will return an error code to the clients, which in turn means that the client will not get an IP address of facebook.com or whatever, and the client cannot access facebook.com, in fact. Um, so this is quite annoying, and uh, this will lead to uh, many, many angry people, uh, especially since DNSSEC is a thing, you might believe it or not, but uh, roughly 30% of the internet population is behind validating resolvers. So an impact of this rollover might have effect on many, many people on the internet. Luckily, there is a mechanism to automatically exchange or replace this key, this trust anchor, at the recursive resolvers. Uh, there's a protocol for that, and I will explain it a bit later on. Um, but still, uh, we've seen many validators that use hard-coded keys. Um, we have containers that challenge key updates, and we'll explain a bit why this is. Um, and in general, DNS is something that people forget about. So they configure it once, and they just like leave it running, and they're not used to see if something went wrong or even update things. So this makes the whole routing process quite hard. 
So the whole rollover process took some time. So in 2010, the root zone was signed for the very first time. And originally, the plan was to roll the key then in uh, 2017 already. So therefore, uh, the new key, case K2017, was published in the root zone for the very first time in July 2017. And this is an interesting step for the resolvers that do this automatic update of the keys, because at this point in time, these resolvers see the key for the very first time, and then they keep track whether they see this key in the root zone for 30 consecutive days. And if this is the case, then they add this new key to the, root, uh, to the trust anchor. This didn't go exactly as planned. Um, so uh, a few mo months later, ICANN, which is the organization which kind of coordinated this whole rollover process, put the rollover process on a hold. But luckily, um, more than a year later, the rollover then took place on October 11th, 2018. And then there was this last stage of the rollover, which is the dark gray area here on the right. And this is, was considered more or less housekeeping. So there you have the revocation of the old key, KSK 2010, and you have the removal from KSK 2010 from the root zone. Um, but even though this was considered housekeeping, this um, caused more troubles than, than people expected. So first look at the first stage here on the very left. So everything before the rollover. And in this stage, we use mostly uh, telemetry data, which uh, is uh, provided by resolvers, and uh, quite a bunch of resolvers support this. And the goal of this telemetry data, which is defined in uh, RFC 8145, is that resolvers signal to the root servers which key they're currently trusting. And they do that usually once per day. And the idea was that if we see enough resolvers trusting this new key, then it is safe to actually replace this key at the, at the root. In our data, we used data from ICANN, A, B, and J root, and we've measured signals from up to 100,000 validators daily. And this is already the data that you see here. So what you see here is the number of resolvers or validators that have trust in KSK 2010, the old key, and KSK 2017 in the new key before the rollover. And you can see that the trust in KSK 2010 is almost at 100%, so this is great. And you can also see that the trust in KSK 2017 is rising slowly. At the beginning, these are resolvers that are either, you have a question? Yeah, how can there be trust in KSK 2017 when it's not even published yet? Um, yeah, it's, um, that's a good question. Um, so at this point in time, it was published in the root zone, but it was already public, it was, people know how this key would look like. So you could configure it manually yourself or resolvers could already, resolver vendors could already pack it into their, um, into their software. So it, people who would install this new version of the resolver would already have this new key in the trust anchor. Um, and then in July 2017, then finally this new key was published in the root zone. And then this 30-day hold down timer starts. So resolvers will check whether they see this new key for 30 consecutive days, and after 30 days, they will add this key to the trust anchor, and this is something that we happen here, see here. This is this massive jump in trust in case K2017. So this is great, like 90% of resolvers have now this new key, but 90% is maybe not good enough, because yeah, actually, 8% of resolvers do not trust KSK 2017. And at this point in time, we didn't really know why and whether we should worry about that. And this worried the community in ICANN that much that they now put the rollover process basically on a hold for an undefined period of time to give the community in ICANN more time to figure out what is going on, why do we see so many resolvers and not trusting uh, this new key. And this also gave us more time to dig a bit more into the data. And in this case, we looked at BRU data because we had access to that. And we there noticed that there were a bunch of resolvers, roughly 6,000, 7,000 of them, that only sent uh, RFC telemetry data only one, one day or once, basically. And what we also then noticed there is that they also sent only a few number of DNS queries. But among these DNS queries, there were DNS queries to a domain name which uh, was related to a VPN provider. 
So what we did is we downloaded the version, the Android version of this VPN software, and uh, we looked whether they have some DNSSEC related configurations. And we found out that they hard coded KSK 2010 in their code, uh, and not KSK 2017. And this is basically what, what caused this weird signal on their side. And we contacted the VPN provider, they confirmed us this issue, um, and they rolled, they updated their software, and you can see the impact of this update quite clearly on this figure. So this is the figure of fraction of resolvers that only trust KSK 2010, so low is better. And we can see that when they release the new software, we can see a, a quite clear impact here. This insight, um, but also other insights from the community, put back the confidence in that the rollover might actually work. Um, yeah, question? What's the huge spike? Uh, the huge, like, yeah, this, this whole figure is a huge, uh, huge mysterium. So we can see this correlation with the VPN release, but it has quite some weird uh, things as well. We have the spike here. We don't know what that is. Uh, we have this spike here after the actual rollover uh, where we see a rise of resolvers who don't trust uh, KSK 2017 again. Um, and we also don't know what that is. Um, so this is uh, something that we'll talk about later on is that the telemetry data that we have has some flaws. Uh, and we probably have to fix that before the new rollover as well. Um, so there, there are quite some open questions in this data still as well. Nevertheless, people thought, okay, now we're on the safe side. So we can move on with the rollover. And uh, this uh, I will explain in a minute. So just briefly, some takeaways from before the rollover. Um, we see most validators uh, picked up KSK 2017 correctly. So this is actually a good thing, this mechanism to automatically trust, uh, update the trust anchors does work reasonably well. Um, but we can also see that one single application can influence the trust anchor signal um, a lot. And this is maybe also something that we've seen with this spike early on, because what you can do, for example, with IPv6 is you could also just create artificially the signals and you can manipulate the signal such that you see way more resolvers and do not trust case K2017 at the root service than are actually uh, deployed in the wild. So you can really uh, play with the signal and this is uh, one of the downsides of the signal. And what we also saw is that now applications do DNS, and they even do DNSSEC for some weird reason. Um, so this might have an influence on telemetry and also on, on the deployment of trust anchors as well. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So. It, yeah. Just a quick question. Can anyone hear the, the qu question? Okay. Um, if the new version, the question was if the new version now trusts both keys or like uh, the new key as well. Um, yes, the, it does trust it, but I'm not sure how they implemented the update. So imagine there's another rollover in the future. Maybe they run into the same problems. I'm not sure about that. Okay. Let's uh, move to the actual rollover. Um, now, finally, one year later, after the original planned date, on October 11th uh, at 4 p.m. UCC, the rollover took place. And at that point in time, we were particularly interested in what is the impact for the end user. Do they see any issues uh, when accessing the internet or when they uh, ask questions in the DNS? And Unfortunately, we can't get information of all the 30% of the internet population that are behind validating resolvers, but we can use another measurement platform which actually at least gives us insight in quite a lot of other users, which is the RIPE Atlas uh, measurement network. And RIPE Atlas, for people who don't know that, is a, a RIPE Atlas uh, is a bunch of probes or small computers which are deployed basically all over the world. Um, I think right now there are more uh, than 10,000 of them. And from these RIPE Atlas probes, you can do your own measurements. For example, you can send your own DNS queries. And with the help from RIPE, uh, we set up a bunch of measurements that we're running con continuously every single hour. We uh, send up measurements from every single uh, RIPE Atlas probe. And um, 
Here we checked first at what point in time do resolvers actually notice that the key was changed. Because in DNS you have caching and stuff like that, so this rollover was not visible to resolvers immediately. And the second one, of course, was do resolvers run into troubles? And uh, with that, we observed more than 35,000 resolver addresses and 3,000 different autonomous systems. So uh, for the first question, at what point in time did resolvers actually notice that there was this rollover? Um, in this figure, you can see resolvers that see the new uh, key set in the root zone, and you can see the resolvers who see the old key set in the uh, root zone. And roughly after eight hours, you can see these two lines crossing. So this means roughly after eight hours, 50% of the resolvers that we were monitoring see that this new key is used. And at this point in time, when these resolvers would not have the new key, they would then fail um, validation and would respond with an error code to their clients. So at this point in time, we would also really see if there's a huge impact with the rollover. And we treated this like um, every, every few minutes, I think, and uh, the, at least the DNS population looked very closely at this line and um, uh, were very interested in whether things, um, uh, what, the, what the deployment is of the rollover. You can also see in this figure a bunch of jumps. Um, these jumps um, are from uh, big resolver operators that then use this new key, so for example, Google or Cloudflare. And what we also observed in this data was that a bunch of resolvers seem to have fetched the old key just before the rollover. And we were wondering whether this was happening on purpose. Um, and we reached out to operators, and one operator of a large European ISP confirmed to us that they actually flushed the caches before the rollover on purpose, fetched the old key, would cache this old key, uh, and this would give them more time to actually sit out and wait what would happen during the rollover. And uh, they did that because at around the same time of the rollover, there was uh, the DNS org meeting, which is like a DNS community meeting, and uh, especially there was the social dinner in the evening, and they didn't want to be bothered while having beers, so this is why they uh, got themselves a bit more time. So now we know that after roughly eight hours, we see um, that 50% of the internet population that we measure at least uh, would notice an impact. Now we are, of course, wondering whether there was some measurable impact on the client side. And therefore, we looked at the resolvers and checked whether they were validating before the rollover or stopped validating after the rollover or had some other um, uh, changes in their, in their state. And the good news is that 34,000 of the resolvers that we monitored did not run into any troubles. So they just kept on validating before the rollover and kept on validating after the rollover, or they didn't do validation of DNSSEC before the rollover, and they also did not turn DNSSEC validation on after the rollover, surprisingly. Um, however, a few resolvers, um, roughly 1,700 of them, had some troubles uh, that we observed. So 970 of them were validating before the rollover, but suddenly uh, returned some error code after the rollover. And 700 resolvers were validating before the rollover, but turned off validation after the rollover. Now, we also correlated this information with another data set, which is the day in the life of the internet data set, which is a data set where root server operators publish every single DNS query to the root servers around the time of the rollover, or almost every root server. And what we knew from earlier experiments that if a resolver runs into trouble with the key, it would then start sending a lot of queries for the DNS key record set. So we checked whether we see for these resolvers more DNS key queries than uh, after the rollover than before the rollover, and we noticed that for 360 of these resolvers, they sent quite more DNS key queries to the root servers than uh, before the rollover, which is a very strong sign that they actually had troubles because of the rollover. Now we are, of course, also wondering how long would it take them to fix this issue, and here again, the good news is that most of them got fixed quite fast after a few hours. Uh, three of them that we observed, they never got fixed, or at least not uh, a few days after the rollover. And we assume that either these resolvers were abandoned, so no one really cared about them, 
or their clients uh, had a second resolver at their hands, so if one resolver would fail and they would not get a, a response, they would just change to the other resolver and everything is fine again. Maybe they have a bit uh, longer response time, but that's it. Oops. So one quite famous example of a problem, problem with the rollover is the Irish ISP ear. And here, around the time of the rollover, customers complained that they could not access the internet anymore. Um, and a few days later, the operators of EAR actually reported that they had DNS issues. So we were again wondering whether these DNS issues were actually DNSSEC issues. So we turned back again at the number of DNS key queries. And here we look at numbers of A and J root. And for A and J root, We've seen that for the resolvers from EAR, they send suddenly way more DNS key queries directly after the rollover than they would usually do. So like massive amounts. And this is a very strong sign that this DNS problem was actually a dead DNS sec problem. What you also notice here, um, for the people with sharp eyes, is that we have another mysterious bump of uh, DNS key queries after the removal of case K2010. Uh, and I will go into that a bit later as well. Um, we did not contact them uh, directly. I think other people reached out from ICANN, they reached out to them, um, but um, we did not contact them directly. Because I think because they were so big in the news that everyone contacted them, so we just said, okay, we, we leave them alone for now. Do you have a statement of what their problem was? Um, I think, uh, no, we don't have uh, detailed uh, information about, their, uh, about the problem. I mean, they probably did not update their trust anchors. That's probably what, uh, what happened. So takeaways from during the rollover, um, few resolvers had serious problems, but the ones who at least we measured, they recovered fast. So this is a, a quite positive takeaway from the rollover. So let's move to the last stage of the rollover, which was considered, as you remember, more or less housekeeping. And the first one was the revocation of case K2010. Um, and at this point in time, a certain flag was set at the KSK 2010, and uh, this uh, key was then, key with this flag was published in the root zone, and resolvers who do this automatic update of the trust anchor would then see, okay, this key has been revoked, I don't trust this key anymore, um, and I don't use it for validation anymore. And then there was the last stage here um, that the KSK 2010 was finally removed from the root zone. In the meanwhile, also KSK 2010 has been also removed from the hardware security module, so it has been completely destroyed. But first, let's go back to the number of DNS key queries. Um, we have already seen for ear case that they send way more DNS key queries uh, to the root servers because that troubles, and this is data from ANJ root, and also here we see that uh, a partially expected increase in DNS key queries after the rollover. This was partially expected because we knew that there were resolvers who were abandoned and who were never, no one cared about, so we expected the number of DNS key queries would rise to some extent. But something that we did not expect was that after the revocation of case K2010, the number of DNS key queries would rise even further. And this increase even reached 7% of the total query load at the root servers, which was, at least for some rooted server operators, quite worrying. Others said, we don't care, we can handle that. But others said, ah, oh, it's maybe something that we have to um, look into, also because we were not sure whether this increase would even continue. But luckily, at some point in time, um, we removed KSK 2010 from the root zone, and then the load dropped again to the load which was before the rollover, after the rollover. Um, this is data from ANJ root. Uh, we also checked whether we uh, have some kind of bias here. So we looked into another data set and confirmed that we can see for almost all other root server operators the same pattern. So all other root server operators have this massive increase in DNS key queries. However, what is also interesting is that we don't see this increase for all the root server operators, which is another quite interesting fragment that we can't really explain. Uh, so not all of the root servers are the same. Um, the question is, which are those? Um, let me check. I think it's B root and it's boom, 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 maybe E root. Colors are not great. Um, yeah. 
Uh, but they are, uh, so B root is a relatively small one, and um, the other one should qu be quite large. So, yeah, it doesn't have something to do with the size. Yeah. Um, you stopped in October 11th, 2018. So after yes, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I left out some details here, but uh, technically you have in DNSSEC, you have, in this case, a key signing key and a zone signing key. And the zone signing key has been rolled multiple times before. Um, but the key signing key, which then signs the zone signing key, has been replaced for the very first time at that point in time. So in October 11th, we then, uh, sign the record set with the zone signing key for the very first time with the new key signing key. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a reason why I left this out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, of course, we were wondering uh, who caused, what caused these massive amount of DNS key queries. So, um, what we first did, we sent out a bunch of DNS chaos queries to sources who send these massive amounts of DNS key queries. And what DNS chaos queries can do, in some cases, the uh, resolvers could tell us which resolvers of the, they're running. Um, you can also block this information, but um, some of them, some of the resolvers answered us, uh, answered the, to the DNS chaos queries, and it revealed that mostly older versions of bind was running on them. And then we also reached out to operators and a large French cloud hosting provider who cannot be named further, um, confirmed to us that some of their sources uh, were running older versions of Bind indeed. And uh, a university even gave us their configuration files. So we took the configuration file, and the, the configuration file basically said um, they did not contain KSK 2017, but they did contain KSK 2010. Uh, DNSSEC enable flag was set to false, and the DNSSEC validation flag was unset, uh, leaving it to the default state of yes. Um, so we took this configuration, um, run a, spun up a bind resolver from scratch, um, so with empty cache and everything. We sent up a, out a bunch of random DNS queries, and then we then observed the number of DNS key queries that the resolver would send. And in some cases, we can see that the resolver would send quite massive amounts of DNS key queries but not in all cases. So this makes reproducing this thing very, very hard. Um, we reached out to, uh, to IC, the folks behind Bind. Uh, they did not confirm us this issue, um, but we're still quite confident, um, actually they didn't respond at all, um, but we're still quite confident that uh, this is one of the reasons at least for this massive amount of DSK queries. Um, so I mentioned er earlier the telemetry protocol where the server sends to the root servers which key it has configured, but this does not allow you as a user to check what kind of keys your resolver that you're using maybe in your network has configured. So there was another protocol which has been developed uh, roughly before uh, the rollover, which, calls, uh, which is called root sentinel. And with root sentinel, what you can do is you can send a specific DNS query to your um, resolver and the resolver would then tell you, hey, I have this key configured or or don't, I don't have this key configured. And what we now did was we used, again, Wipe Atlas probes and sent this specific query to all the resolvers that are configured for Wipe Atlas probes. And what we can see here is that, first of all, the number of resolvers who support this telemetry protocol is uh, rising quite, quite steadily, so this is nice. But what you also see here is that we have the return of KSK 2010 after the removal of the KSK 2010 from the root zone. And we were wondering why. Um, so in this particular case, um, because RIPE Atlas has some biases and it's not very well dis distributed, this massive increase is mostly caused by the very signed public resolvers. And luckily we have very signed co-authors, <clears throat> so they could reach out to their operator team and they confirmed to us that at this point in time, they upgraded their resolvers to a newer version of Unbound, which would now also support this telemetry protocol. But they also packaged uh, their software with the old key and the new key both configured. So this is why that now the key, uh, the resolver would trust KSK 2010, and they would also signal this to their clients. But if you look very, very closely, you can see that even directly after the removal, this red line is rising slowly. 
Um, so we return back to the other telemetry protocol, which is uh, the telemetry, telemetry protocol where the resolver signal to the root service, which they have configured. And here we can see this uh, increase quite clearly. Um, we can see that almost 50% of the resolvers uh, that we measure with this protocol trust case K2010 again. Uh, so this is also, again, another weird thing. And in this case, uh, we think that we found another culprit. In this case, it's unbound. Or no, in this case, it's Ubuntu, a long-term supporting version with Unbound. And what Ubuntu is doing is they ship this Ubuntu version with KSK 2010 and KSK 2017 in their trust anchor already. And if you install this Ubuntu version with Unbound, um, and you run Unbound, of course, uh, after the revocation, then everything is fine. Because then Unbound would ask for the root uh, service, OK, hey, which keys are currently published at the root zone, it would see that KSK 2010 has been published there and has been revoked. And so it would then also revoke KSK 2010 locally as well. But if, if you would install the same version after the removal, then Unbound would query for the root servers, would not find any information about KSK 2010, and what would just keep KSK 2010 in the trust anchor and would trust this key. In this case, this is not a big problem because KSK2010 has been removed and has not been compromised. But imagine if KSK2010 has been compromised, then this would mean that the resolvers would still trust this compromised key and could therefore be vulnerable to, uh, to attacks. So some takeaways from after the rollover. Um, no one expected the massive flood of DNS key queries. Uh, this is really something that people did not expect. People expected that things would break directly at the rollover, but no one really thought about and cared about the steps after the rollover. What we also see here is that trust anchor management comes in different shapes and colors. Um, we have trust anchors that are managed by applications. We have trust anchors that are managed by operating systems. And this all can cause problems. So for example, um, in the case of, in case you have a Docker configuration, imagine that you have a um, a system that you um, run, uh, set up before, during the time when the new key is published, but before these 30 consecutive days stop, you restart the system again. Then this counter would start again and try to see, do I see this new key for 30 consecutive days? And if you then restart the system again before these consecutive days have passed, then this resolver would still not trust this key. So this is also another problem. And what we can see here, of course, is that shipping trust anchors with software, like hard-coded software, has long-lasting effects. So these observations led us to a bunch of discussions. And I think the first discussion also is kind of related to the, the first keynote. It's about telemetry or information about uh, and logging about your system. And we now have two telemetry protocols. Um, which are quite useful, so they give, give us information about uh, resolvers from different vantage points, but they also have some downsides. And the first one is that they don't allow us to identify the true source of a signal. So in DNS, we, we love these resolving chains, so you have one resolver that for forwards the DNS query to another resolver, that forwards it to another resolver to a load balancer, and then finally it uh, uh, comes to your, to your uh, root server. Um, and this distorts the signal. So if we see the signal at the root server, we can't say w which is the true source of the signal, which resolver does not have trust in the uh, new key. And the other w downside is that we do not really know for how many users um, a resolver is responsible for. So in case of these 8% of resolvers who did not have trust in the new key before the rollover, we did not really know whether we should care about these resolvers or not. So it would be nice to have some kind of estimates of how many users a signal is representative. But we acknowledge that both have some privacy issues as well, and they need to be discussed. The second one is, do we need to change trust anchor management? So nowadays, applications do DNS. Um, some even do DNSSEC. And imagine that you have multiple applications in your system, and every application does DNS, and every application also 
uh, manages their own trust anchors, then every single application has to take care of updating this trust anchor themselves. So we think that shipping trust anchors centrally in the operating system and let the operating system do the update of the trust anchor might be a good idea. And uh, Debian already uh, does that as far as I know. So to conclude, um, we think that the rollover overall was a success. Um, we also show that an independent analysis from an independent team uh, provides valuable additional information. We show that telemetry must be kept in mind in the early stage of protocol development because these telemetry protocols that I showed you here were all added to the DNSSEC quite late, so the deployment was not great and it also had some downsides. And so we urge that protocol developers, as good as possible, keep telemetry in mind at the early stage. And we think that trust anchors should be managed centrally. Uh, with that, there is more information in the paper. Um, there's some data available, and I think we have some time for questions, though. The problem uh, is yes, you, you keep the results each for a long time or forever. Uh, so the question is, um, does, the, the, uh, does this observation um, is a good argument for keeping the revoke key and the root zone for a very long time? Um, yes, we think you should keep the key f uh, in the root zone for a longer time, uh, but of course there are worries about the response size of the DNS key sets of the root, um, because a too large response size could cause fragmentation, and we know from experiments or we know from real life as well that fragmentation, especially on IPv6, seems to be quite a problem. Um, so yes, we argue for that, um, and we've seen with uh, other measurements as well that it's maybe not such a big problem as, as we might expect, but yeah, we should yeah, be careful about that. Because especially at some point in time, you might want to add a new key as well, and then you have another rollover, so you have to try, uh, keep the other old key as well in the record set, so the record set will grow quite a lot. This is a good question. So the question is, uh, how fast can we actually roll a key in case of a compromise? Uh, and this is uh, tricky, um, especially because we have this 30-day hold-down timer. So technically, we would have to, especially or at least for resolvers who only rely on this hold-down timer, we would have to wait 30 consecutive days to, for them to update to this new key. And only then we can, um, we can uh, replace this key. Um, probably what will happen realistically is that people will have to update manually um, and oh, I think I'm destroying this thing here. Um, and that um, people have to will update manually or that we just like reach out to all the DNS operators that are out there and that they have to update their stuff themselves. And if you have a security patch in an operating system that handles the keys then you might be able to react to that a bit quicker. Is the next rollover planned already? Um, is the next rollover planned already? Um, there are, right now, ICANN has opened up a discussion period, I'm not sure how they call it, but now it's kind of, a, they ask the community to provide input uh, for future rollovers, um, and based on this input, they want to plan a new rollover. I think there's some guidelines which say the role of root key should be rolled every four years, five years, I'm not sure about that. Um, but right now they first want to evaluate, okay, what, is the, what are the next steps? For example, should we add um, an additional key in advance? So we maybe add already a new key as soon as we roll uh, the old key, we additionally add a new key so that resolvers can pick up this new key. These things need to be discussed. And yeah, they're waiting for the input of the community. Um, so the question is, um, how do we convince people that this is a good idea and how to... Uh, um, we, ha we have, like, we have uh, people from Ananet Labs, for example, on our author team, and they are in close contact with uh, the uh, different operating system developers. 
Uh, so there, uh, we get in touch with people and try to convince them this is a good idea. All right, if there are any questions, then thanks. And